Well, I think then we can uh, start with the next panel. So good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the panel on the future of the shipping industry, industry preparedness and uh, initiatives. And I guess we had already today very good uh, panel discussions here on the stage, and I hope also the next 40 minutes will be quite uh, interesting uh, for you. So uh, today, ocean transport accounts for roughly 80% of the global cargo volume. And uh, over the last 10 years, we saw a significant increase of transport capacity, which was uh, boosted by new buildings in uh, different segments. And uh, well, when we look, what are the factors contributing to the uh, change of the shipping industry? I think then we can uh, see several factors, and I'd like to mention just a few. So we see uh, trade wars and uh, economic sanctions. Like uh, these days, we see that several factories are moving out of China, going to even lower production cost countries. And uh, this is even uh, fostered by the trade war between China and US. On the other hand, we see also the sanctions on Iran, stopping their oil export, which is uh, impacting also the sourcing from other countries. When we look to the regulatory environment, then we see the sulfur cap 2020 is just around the corner. And uh, it looks like that uh, gas as fuel could be the next fuel for the future, or at least for a kind of transition period. Nevertheless, uh, gas is not only a privilege for the shipping industry. We also see that uh, uh, shore-based power stations are switching from uh, coal to gas. And uh, well, when we look to the uh, uh, technological side, then uh, we see that uh, these days shipping is very much uh, impacted by digitalization, by autonomous shipping and also the Internet of Things. All these are for sure new opportunities for the shipping industry. On the other hand, we see also that uh, there is a concern amongst the maritime industry about cybersecurity issues, safety issues and also about jobs of seafarers coming from low labor cost countries, these jobs might be negatively affected through these trends. Last but not least, I'd like to uh, mention uh, the industry consolidation, also the growing ship sizes. Uh, when we look back into the 80s, there have been roughly 30 to 40 big liner companies dominating the container shipping market. These days, when we see on the major routes, only three operators are dominating these uh, routes. And uh, well, I just mentioned a few factors which are impacting the shipping industry in the future. And uh, today I'd like to discuss this topic a bit more here on the stage with uh, high industry leaders. And I'm very happy that I have here really top shots on the stage and I'd like to introduce the panelists to you. So uh, I'd like to start with, uh, yeah, normally not to not really necessary to introduce, he's one of the shipping gurus here uh, right now, Martin Stopford, the non-executive president of uh, Clarkson Research. Mm -hmm. Then from the Danish uh, Maritime Authority, Andreas Nordset. And then from uh, the uh, vice president of BIMCO and the uh, executive chairman of Anglo Eastern Group, Peter Kremers. So I think then we can uh, start with the uh, first question and Andreas, I think uh, I start with you. Technology has a substantial impact in shaping the future of shipping. We see that shipping has gone through a lot of technology changes over the last hundred years. <clears throat> in your opinion, how do you rate the pace of technology adoption and how would the seafarer equip themselves for the future? Well, thank you very much, um, Norbert, uh, and, and for, the, for the welcoming remarks and, uh, and also for this question, which I think is... Uh, I really welcome the question also because we need to uh, also get the seafarers into into the equation. Uh, I think there was uh, it was Mark Cameron that uh, at the first panel today um, remembered us all that, that you know we should not forget that in the end it's also about also about people. Uh, when we look at the technology changes over the last hundred years, I would say that we have only had uh, one real technology jump uh, in the history, and that was when we went from wind power to engine power. But I think also that we are living in a time now where we are at the doorstep to a new technology jump because I think that digitalization is uh, offering uh, completely new ways of, uh, of uh, running uh, both the business but also operating the ships. When you ask me in, about my opinion on how I would rate the pace of technology adaption, I would say that 
probably given the fact that that uh, shipping is a asset heavy industry is very huge investments and ship owners need to really take into very deep consideration what they want to invest in and how they're going to use the technology but I would say that we have a very slow adaption I don't think that shipping is is uh, is known for its uh, in, ability and willingness to embrace new technology. I think we're moving very careful, very, very careful. And I think also one of the reasons uh, will be or is that um, um, the operational model we're using, and I'm not talking on the business side, the commercial side I think is, is really adapting and using new technology and digitalization in, in, in all the ways that it makes sense. But if we look at the way we operate ships, then the operational model is based on a model that was created maybe two or three hundred years ago. It's, it's, it's very much uh, the same way that we command ships. We have a deck department, we have an engine department, we have a catering department. There's no bridging between them. There's not much uh, uh, flexibility in, in the way we operate. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges we're facing when it comes to uh, adapting to new technology. And, and in, in, in light of that, I think that it becomes a very good question to ask, so well, what about the seafarers in the future and what we're facing? And um, my take, looking at the development that we are facing, and, and one thing is digitalization, but I think also that the environmental agenda, especially greenhouse gas, uh, but, but also the, the demand for, for uh, coming near to uh, zero, zero impact uh, from the industry, and then also the ocean economy uh, uh, development. And we should not forget that one of the big, big opportunities that lies ahead is also attached to ocean economy. We live in a time now where we can use technology. We can use technology to make use of all the resources in the oceans. We, so I would guess that we will see uh, ocean farming, ocean mining, ocean production, to a scale that we are not even able to imagine today. And that will bring a fantastic new development, uh, both technolo technological, but also when it comes to the seafarers, because I think the seafarers will be key, uh, the maritime competence will be key to, uh, to that development. I think that we should stop talking about, uh, you know, that the seafarers probably, probably will not have a future, but what I think we should st start talking about is uh, what kind of seafarers, and, and that I, I think that we should stop thinking about seafarers in departments that we have deck officers, marine engineers, and, and catering people, but instead uh, we should start to look at the seafarers as a hub of competences. We need flexible people that have all kinds of skills, uh, some basic training, and then they can build upon, and uh, maybe we will have marine engineers that actually will be the master of the, of the platforms in the future. Uh, and, we will have production engineers and production managers and all kind of, uh, of managers uh, on, on, on the ships. Yeah, uh, I think that's basically my, my point here at this, uh, this time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. And uh, maybe Martin or Peter, you like to comment on that? Uh, yes. I, um I think the, the, the you know, one of the unfortunate things about digitalization um, was the fact that in, when we started discussing it three or four years ago, the focus one was, was on autonomous ships. My good friend Oscar Lavander, who I who went round doing lectures, and Oscar, I would do my rather serious thing about um, telematics and better management, and Oscar would produce some wonderful. Photo diagrams of uh, Ronnie the robot at the helm of his Endeavour 2 spacecraft and um, you know I was dead in the water and I think really the, um, the process of moving towards um, digital technology is going to be um, a very much, it has to be hands on, you've got to start somewhere mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm not going to go through all the things that um, one might do, one might say at this stage, because they'll come up later. But um, I, I do think that um, one of the really helpful things um, is the focus that has really shot up the agenda on carbon emissions in the last year. Because until last year, I, you know, you would pedal around telematics and stuff, 
and talked to shipping companies about how you might improve performance by using I-4 technology. But, you know, you felt you were evangelizing with no lever. It wasn't just you just had no way to push it forward. I think now that the digital, the, the carbon issue has come onto the agenda, uh, uh, the industry has bought into that on, on a scale which I haven't seen mm -hmm. in, <clears throat> in recently. And it does look as though not only are the regulators going to push it, but on the whole, the industry has bought into it. And I think that is the lever that will help us because you're not going to do carbon emissions without doing digitalization. And if you want to start right at the beginning, my last comment on this is that, you know, one of our goals should be that every chief executive of shipping company, every shipper, every um, consumer should have certified grams of emission on the products which are transported mm. by sea and I think if we get to that point, that, that everybody in the transport chain knows how much carbon is being produced, you would be astonished how much better decisions could be made. And I think that would be a very good starting point. Peter, any thoughts? Um, as I said to my staff last week, it's, it's not fair that soon I have to retire. <laughs> because as a ship manager and shipping is going to change tremendously the next 20, 20 years, like I've never seen in my life. And uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting time. Um, if you see um, what changes we are doing in the company uh, from a digital point of view, um, um, having seen uh, over, let's say, the last 20 years people on board of the ship or people in the office becoming almost um, experts in filling in of lists <laughs> and checks and checks and lists again and, and being able soon and, and to have all these things done digitally and finally after again 20 years or so having people on board of a ship or people having a, in an office having again time to think and time to look at things and take certain decisions uh, is going to be exciting mm. because uh, yes today nobody has any time anymore to to really think about something um, and that's going to be exciting so in, in my in my view uh, uh, we're going to have ships that are part of your office that will be fully connected um, very soon now we will have um, information gathering from the ships uh, we will have uh, artificial intelligence helping us to digest uh, dissect all this information uh, and reproduce it whether it's for the guy in the office, whether it's for the charter, whether it's for our client, whether it's for the captain on board of a ship, in the way that he needs it and what he needs in the way that he needs it, so that all becomes quite transparent and, and all will become quite truthful and, and, and we will have a, a, a much better environment uh, to work and I'm convinced of that. And if you then see um, uh, how do we attract people in our industry, I I'm convinced that this will help. Because all these things uh, will make our industry a little bit more sexy for, for younger people. Um, frankly speaking, if, if, if you have young people coming on board of a ship and you see what they need to do, it's not fun. Uh, it's not much fun anymore. So uh, again, this, this complete change of the way that we manage ships, uh, that the information is processed, uh, I really hope that, that we'll end up with a little bit more sexy industry uh, that, um, that will attract different kind of people. Um, and that's only from the digital point of view. Um, I'm sure that within the next 10 years, 
the way we produce uh, electricity for our generators, uh, the different kind of fuel, carbon neutral fuels that are coming in, uh, is gonna is gonna make tremendous changes to uh, to our ships, uh, and will again require a total different breed of people, um, and and that's why, um, as maybe some of you know, we, we we have our own training centers and our own pre C schools, and 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 being able to. Uh, to tie this all up together to who do you select, who you train, and, and where do they go in terms of the new technologies on board the ships is, is going to be uh, a very exciting change. So um, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I uh, can't keep on running for another 20 years because shipping is going to be tremendously different and tremendously exciting. Mm. Mm. Okay, very good. Then Martin, let me come to you. IMO has set aggressive targets for 2020 and uh, 2050. Are you confident the targets are achievable and uh, what are the hurdles the industry is facing and what are the efforts they may need to put into to move towards this goal? Um, okay, well, uh, the targets uh, were not based on any particular technical criteria. They, as I understand it, what happened was that you had a debate where about a bit like Brexit, where about half of IMO were in favour of um, phasing out greenhouse gases altogether from ships, and the other half didn't want to do anything. Uh, Andrea, so actually you probably know, them, but, but this is what I was told. Um, and in the end, with, with a, a, a sort of mop their brows and settled for 50% cut by 2050 compared with 2008. Mm -hmm. And 2008 was chosen as a base because it was the year when the shipping industry was operating flat out, basically. So if you take the carbon emissions from 2008, um, then you've got an, a good base moving forwards. Um, and that turned out to be rather good for shipping because, um, in fact, since then, uh, the calculations done in the IMO studies, and I think the latest ones I've got is a 2014 study. I think that's the latest. Um, and that shows that actually shipping's emissions are no higher today than they were in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so we are, because the fleet has slowed down from 14 knots to 11 knots, so we are well on our way to achieving the 2050 target. And... Um, you know, you can always slow down a bit more if you want to. So I, I think in, in theory, um, the, 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 you know, even before we even get onto technology, we have a very good chance of delivering, as long as you're prepared to accept that you trade your ships much more slowly, which is good news for emissions, but it's very bad news if you paid um, $80 million for your VLCC, expecting it to do... Um, 12 voyage or 12 voyages a year and it ends up doing seven voyages a year this is you know no good for your balance sheet so the, the, there's a cost on that side so that's the first my first point is we, we can we can do very well by slowing down that's the easy part we've already used up most of that um, the, the the second point about that is that I've talked about the IMO emissions study um, which was a, a, a report commissioned by the IMO about, from good quality consultants about the emissions by the industry. But actually, we don't know how much carbon the ships actually emit. What happened was that the <laughs> consultants calculated, they took the world fleet, they took the figures on the database about the engines in the world fleet, they made an estimate of the speed and they worked out the carbon that might have been emitted. We don't know. And we are a million miles from still from the point where shipping companies actually know how much carbon they emit uh, in actually in a certifiable way day by day. And if there's anybody in the audience who's in a shipping company who's got that information, do let me know, because I think that would be fantastic. But I've worked with a few companies, and it's surprisingly hard to do. I don't know, Peter. Mm. It, it, um, and so we, we've made a lot of progress there. We haven't made much progress on the other things. And 
Um, <clears throat> in terms of, because the other thing IMO said, if I may say a few more things, is that in addition to cutting to 50% by 2050, we have to go to zero carbon as quickly as possible. And they've said, have they said anything else, Andrea? Since, since they they, they said anything? minimum 50% with the aim of... 70. Yeah. Yeah. Much more if you yeah, can do yeah, it. Yeah. Yes, and so um, I think from that point of view, um, I, I, I tend, to, I've heard a lot of discussion about um, this morning on the panels about the different ways you can do this. You can, and it seems to me there's three things you can do. You can fine tune the diesel, the diesel ships in many, many ways. Um, you can go for um, LNG and maybe in due course you put, you start to develop hybrid battery technology alongside LNG, which gives you another layer of energy saving because ships don't just steam. I mean, a lot of ships are spending up almost 50% of their time, especially short sea trade, 50% of their time maneuvering in coastal areas. And um, so that's the second thing is you do LNG and hybrid and then that opens the way for the fuel cells, which everybody's talked about, that the consensus seems to be that we might start to be putting fuel cells, serious fuel cells to sea by 2030 is the, mm. the number. Every, it doesn't say that's, uh, it's just what everybody seems to agree at the moment. Um, and I, I, I guess where I want to end is by saying, if you're gonna have that discussion, I don't think you should see it as competition between these different systems. I think you should see it as a series of phasings in the same way that um, I think, Peter, mm. you mentioned steam. And there was a phase. It took about 50 years to, to perhaps a little bit more, about 70 years to phase out steam engines. And during that period, in many trades, sailing ships were just as competitive as steam engines on many routes. And the, the sailing ships were being built in uh, you know the first serious deep sea steamship was 1860, and they were, the Germans Leitzlein was still building very high quality tall ships which were extremely efficient. Um, come around the Cape with 3,000 tons of cargo, zero carbon for uh, um, average six knots. Crew of 17 people on your steamship, you needed 28 to 30 people because you had, and you had to pay for coal. You know. So I, I think, and then we started to phase in diesel. So I do think you should see these different things as phases in, uh, and, and three different phases, which we do so we get the, the best out of what technology is available at the moment. Sorry, that was a bit of a finish now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. So Peter or Andreas, do you like to comment on that? I, I just wanted to add one thing. I've been, uh, I've been lucky to be invited to the Global Ship Owners Forum, the Danish Ship Owners Forum, for, for a few years, and last time in, in Singapore. And it's amazing, I see how, how ship owners start to think differently. I mean, everybody now starts to say, yes, we have to reduce the carbon footprint, and we have to invest in new technologies. And, and, and I think that's, that was my home taking the last time. That is that it, it seems now to come from inside shipping saying uh, we need we need to play to play ball that 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 was for me a, a major a major development um, and and uh, if you see what's happening on 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 the on the on the side of the, of the diesel engines being 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 ready for ammonia um, uh, we are doing some tests with with hydrogen on, on board of ships um, it my god it goes fast mm. it goes it goes tremendously fast uh, and i'm i'm quite confident that indeed we 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 start to think differently and and when we think differently the solutions will be there mm. andreas any thoughts from your uh, side i agree very much with it in the both what Martin said, but also in particular what Peter is saying, that uh, at, uh, I, there's a completely different uh, feeling now. I think I think we are all in, uh, everybody's in the same boat. We are no longer discussing if we're going to do something, but what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. I, I, I think also that it's very important that we do, everybody work together in finding new knowledge and finding sort of 
cracking the nut on what will be the fuel of the future. I'm, I personally, I'm sitting on the fence on LNG because it's LNG is basically fossil fuel. It's uh, it's also in itself a greenhouse gas that is much much worse to 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 the greenhouse effect than CO2 is. So I'm not sure that LNG will sort of be part of the equation in the future. I think much more than on the short term. Maybe ammonia will be interesting, but I think also hydrogen and then again biofuels. But one thing I would just that has been come very clear to me for the in, in, in recently is really that it's not enough that we are only looking at the ships. We really need to work together with the whole supply chain because if we are going to introduce new kind of fuels, then we also need to think what kind of investments uh, will be needed to ensure that there actually will be a supply chain established around the world. And that also leads into thinking about, okay, so will we maybe see Asia going for hydrogen, Europe going for ammonia, South America going for, I don't know, bio, if this, uh, they make from sugar canes or whatever. It, it can be, uh, there, there can be some, some differences also, which again then loops back to the uh, engine manufacturers that we probably will need technology that will be capable of running on all kind of fuels. And I'm just saying this is really, really complex and I do not envy those of you who are in the consideration of investments of the future because like, <laughs> it's really, it's really challenging. But again, the only way forward is to continue on the, on the wake uh, the, that we are riding now, that everybody wants to do something, and then we need to find uh, the results. And just one uh, final comment on this in the wake of what you said, Martin. The more everybody will ship in with data, the better we will be off together. Because uh, as Martin pointed out, we do have some flaws in the available data. Uh, and that goes the, all the way around. So I'm just saying that you know, we, 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 you, the industry, ship managers, ship owners, operators really need to supply data uh, for those who are calculating on all the things to, for the, that will be a very important part of the future solutions. Yeah, could, I mean, I, I, th I think I'd like to ask Andreas and Peter questions because, uh, I mean, on the gas issue, as I understand it, you do get about a 20% carbon emissions saving on the um, LNG. Everything being equal. Yeah. Other, everything being equal. And in a sense, the phrase that I would say here is beggars can't be choosers. In other words, what I have is a model. I run this stuff out to 2050. And you, your starting point is not to discuss engines. Your starting point is say, how are we going to deliver the world's cargo? And the option at the moment is diesel engines burning oil or diesel engines burning oil. Mm. And if you, mm. and if you, kick out LNG, that is um, a problem. And there are serious problems with hydrogen because hydrogen is only green if you produce it from um, uh, biomass fuels. Exactly. Or, yeah, and, or, or nuclear. Oh, yes. Any, is there any, any nuclear enthusiasts here? <laughs> I am. He wants to do nuclear. Oh, we got one at the back. Yeah. Seriously, yeah, who's... Well, nuclear, <laughs> define nuclear. Yeah, Martin. let's... Well, I think, Chairman, could we, could we invite the people who are keen on nuclear to tell us what they think? Uh, sure. Uh, could we? Yeah, why not? Sure. Would you, would you like to say... Uh, uh, was, was that a joke, or would you like to say, uh, give us the case? I... Yeah, yes, yes. You, uh, uh, the... the you, you have three cameras, but no... Uh, no microphone. No microphone. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, oh, here we are. The microphone's coming. Hello. Yeah, speak up. Yeah. Mm? I, I, I don't think it's about running uh, nuclear reactors on ships. It's more about producing clean energy from nuclear power. That, that's the way yeah. I look at it. Oh, okay. Whether you're mm. producing electricity mm. or whether you're producing yeah. hydrogen, uh, those types of things. Yep. And given that domestic shipping could well go electric uh, in, in, in some countries in the next 10, 20 years, then uh, nuclear power makes sense to produce electricity for those ships. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, in yeah. fact, there are. Uh, do, do you. Um, do you uh, there's another gentleman in the front here who. Um, I can't read you. <laughs> sitting, sitting next to you, Nicholas. Um, you said you were keen on nuclear, right? I, I, I put my hand up, I raised my hand up here. Yep. And I just think that it's um, something that has been dismissed um, very aggressively because of very high profile um, disasters that have happened around it. However, the bang for your buck that you get from nuclear is um, something that shouldn't 
be completely dismissed out of hand when we're looking at reducing carbon the way we are. Right. Yeah. I mean, the usual, uh, the, the, the usual complaint about nuclear is that you can't, nobody can imagine sending out a nuclear ship manned, that sort of operated in the way we operate ships today, if mm. you see what I mean. But or the whole sense of what we're talking about in this panel is that we are going to be running ships in a very different way in 20 years' time. This is what Peter's saying. And, um, yeah, and maybe, yeah. I mean, I've met people in the States who put a very good case together for sort of small, self-contained yep. nuclear power yep. parts. So maybe, and I, I must say, it's, to be honest, the lineup of alternative candidates going back to the question, how do we move yeah. this stuff? Yeah, there is, there is another, uh, let's say, promising technology, that is that you, uh, you take hydrogen from water and you produce that uh, by uh, green uh, electricity and you catch CO2 from the air, put it together and produce uh, uh, diesel. Uh, it's done on a small scale uh, today. Uh, if, if, if that can be done on a big scale, you have the same engines, uh, um, same, same airplane engines, same, uh, same ships Sounds engines. Sounds a bit and, too and, good to be true. I and, think and, we and no, get no, some no, no. in this. No, no, <laughs> the, 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 the technology is, is there. Uh, it's a question how much energy do you I take know. in, put in to take it out. But So, I again, there, I, I'm, I'm convinced that there are various ways uh, mm -hmm. of, of achieving this, okay. definitely. But that, I think that's exactly why we simply need to have people go into research and development and, yes. and, and, yep. and, and test it. Uh, yes. and, uh, and so that we cannot rule anything. And just for the record, I'm, I'm not ruling LNG out, at least not short term, medium term. But if you want to have a carbon free future, then I fail to see LNG as part of the equation, at least if it's LNG that's taken out of the ground. Uh, but that's, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, one of the problems here is if I, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at the shipbuilding because I, I mean I think one of the areas that will have to change most is the shipyards. Ship and um, if you look at the car, I mean the car industry um, when they developed hybrid designs and when they were doing the sort of um, electric car systems which they use today, which started in the 80s, they they could put massive teams. I mean, Toyota can put a big team on this because the car industry produces 100 million cars a year. And so um, basically you've got the budget to do it. Mm. Whereas um, the shipyards produce uh, 2,000 ships a year or the, you know, over 100 meters. And um, they, um, uh, they, those 2,000 ships are many, many different designs. You know, it's not just... Mm. One or two. So I think, how how can a shipyard get the resources? I mean, how, Andres, how, I mean, mm. how do we get the resources mm. on this? Um, okay. Peter, Peter. Yeah. Please, please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if if the answer is probably autonomous ships, uh, be it in thirty years or in fifty years or in, in, in whatever that will be, will not be produced by shipyards as you see them today. I can't imagine that every shipyard somewhere around the corner starts to build uh, uh, and, and design an autonomous ship. So no. it, it we will just, be... We just heard Paul <laughs> all over talking about <laughs> it this, will be, It will be packages which are designed by one or two manufacturers, the whole thing, and probably assembled in, in, an, in a number of, 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 of shipyards. And... and, and and um, that brings me to, uh, to maybe then the, the next subject, uh, as you asked me, wh where, where is ship management going to in the future? Uh, and, and let's not forget, the only thing a ship manager does today is, is, is uh, training and employing people. Uh, that's the only thing we do, basically, right? So uh, in, in 50 years, mm, we are not there anymore. Um, uh, so, or we have to change our uh, the way we do things. Um, one of the things is that, which we see already now, that engine manufacturers will take a much more active role in, in, in the management of a ship. Um, so, one of the things is that maybe in the future, 
uh, uh, we have had some discussions with shipyards whereby we start to be a subcontractor of a shipyard. Because that's also going to happen. Maybe the shipyard gives you a ship, uh, and, and between now and the total autonomous ship, there will be technically advanced ships. And maybe you, you, you buy it from the shipyard, and you buy it with a 10-year operation. So uh, will the future client of a ship manager be the ship owner, or will it be the shipyard, or it, will it be the main manufacturers, who, the equipment supplies of these? So that is, that is definitely going to change. That has to change. No. Um, the second thing is, which I'm always asked, okay, w w what, what are you going to do with your people? And, and again, there, I think the answer is there will be a, lo a long transgression from the kind of ships and the technology that is today to the kind of ships and the technology that is there uh, in 50 years from now. So we, we need to make sure that we keep on training the people uh, uh, consistent with the technology of, uh, of the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that also changes because that, that will mean much more than we do now, cooperation between ship managers and engine manufacturers mm -hmm. and equipment suppliers mm -hmm. so that uh, uh, we can fine tune this all together. Uh, um, 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 that's basically how I see slowly uh, ship management in the next, whatever, 20, 30 years, changing. Right, I think, uh, unfortunately, the time is uh, already up. Oops. And uh, yeah. I think we had a very interesting right. discussion here. Thank you very much, Andreas, Martin, and uh, Peter. And I think you have really done a great job. So please give a big hand to Andreas, Peter, and Martin. Yeah.